Okay, so let's go around one more time. Um, Mary Grimmie from a very small area. You may have heard of it. It's this very small village on the west coast of Florida called Tampa. Andrea is out in the Quad Cities, out in the middle of Middle America. I don't think we have anybody from the Middle America. Yes, we do, too, because Michelle is from some town that nobody can find west of Chicago. <laughs> FedEx can't find it. UPS can't find it. And the U.S. Mail can't find it either. Yes. All right. We got Pat Sullivan from Forest Hills. Nick, I don't know where Nick is. Nick, where are you today? Are you here in New York or are you visiting? I mean, are you here in Miami or where are you today? Me, that's in my house. That's your house. Okay. Well, good morning yeah. to you. Sergio said this is a donut. Nick is in Port St. Lucie. Chet is here in Miami. Felix is here in Miami. Don Schweitzer okay. is in Ormond Beach. I'm right. I'm Eddie and Alan, I yeah. think, are here now in Miami. Bobby Vance is in, um, in uh, Kissimmee. Maureen Sullivan is out in farm country. Amelia Schweitzer is 10 miles west of Merritt Island. Carol Goldstein is also in Forest Hills. Greg Bowe is here. Griselle Feeney. The Feenies are up in Lake Worth. Danny Sorkin, docent of New York, is from also from Forest Hills, the Forest Hills contingent. And I um, want to um, remind everybody, Surge is reading today. We are having, oh, Forest Hills. There we go. Uh, Cindy and Larry Deach are here this morning. Cindy and Larry are from Port Orange. Um. We have uh, Serge again from Sedona. We have a guest today, and I hope you will have a chance to, uh, maybe she'll stay, if you stay afterwards for a minute, you can talk to her, she's, she's not going to bite. Her name is Andrea. She is a friend. Oh, Pam Gold, Pam Gray is here. We got a, a contingent from Forest Hills. This is really, this is really all souls of Forest Hills with a small contingent in Miami. <laughs> all right. Andrea is a friend of Michelle Latanzio. Andrea is an award-winning poet. You can see her biography on the um, on the bulletin. She's an army vet. Uh, she finished uh, college and divinity school three years, and she is going to enroll in a doctoral program in the fall. And um, <clears throat> hopefully we'll be seeing more of her. I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, we got, uh, John and, um, and Christine Sloan and Cecilia. Hey, Cecilia, where are you? Cecilia, are you there? I know she's there someplace. Okay. <clears throat> so yes, I'm here. guess what? I finally connected with, with JJ, your husband, your, your son. Oh, great. Yes. We're going to be doing a zoom. It only took 10 months on my part, but we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so good morning, everybody. Serge will be um, uh, reading today. Andrea will be reading today. Uh, Gregory Bo, who's going off to Boston University, is going to be doing the tech. Um, let's see. Uh, a couple of announcements. Number one, full time, let me remind everybody we do not slow down for the summer. We are an equal opportunity, all year round annoying agency. We annoy you as much in the summer as we do in the fall, winter, and spring. Do not think you get a vacation for being annoyed in the summertime. Are we clear about that? We are ready to go all during summer. We've got a full schedule ahead. Climate change. Those of you interested in climate change, if you let me know, BESA would like to get together a committee it's doing some work on climate change here in Miami. While she's doing some work on her master's program for um, for her uh, chaplaincy uh, work in the faculty situation. So if any of you are interested in, in climate change, let me know. I will be sending out an email to that effect. Okay, next up on the 11th of, Jan of, of uh, June, Michelle will be sharing. Um, pictures, 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 pictures. We need pictures, everybody. It's that time of the year. We need pictures. Uh, Pat Sullivan is going to be sharing a picture of a pool, not a baptism pool, a pool for party. The rest of Serge is going to be sending pictures of creepy things visiting him now that have been long dormant. A lot of you have all kinds of things that are out there. Pets. We have not had pictures of pets in two years. 
Let's start with the pets again. We need pet pictures. Let's start with the pets. All of you have pets. These are four-legged, not friends. I do not mean friends. So if you have four-legged pets, please send along your pets. Be sure to give them a name, by the way. I don't remember all the names. So one more time, good morning to Mary Grimmy. Andrea is visiting Pat Sullivan, Nick and his friend here in Miami, Dennis Walcott, Chet, Ham, John and um, Christine, Serge Cruz, Maureen, Bobby and Callie Vance, and Alan and Eddie, Don Schweitzer, Felix Becerra, Amelia, Harold, Greg, Grissel. And uh, by the way, you saw a picture of Grissel's daughter. This is not the little girl I used to know. She's, uh, she's, she's growing up into quite a beautiful young lady. Danny Sorkin is here, Cecilia and Larry Deach, Cecilia down the street, and Pat can care. We want to light our memorial candle today in special memory of all of the vets who come back who are seriously emotionally injured and never get the care they need. So many young Young, and I mean young, 19, 20, and 21-year-olds get drafted or get sent into the service. They're not prepared in many, many ways and come back very, very post-traumatic stress syndrome. And we want to remember those who do not get their care for a variety of complex reasons, and we remember them today. We hold them close, not just today, but every day. Our opening for Memorial Sunday is from Miami-Dade College. I would ask you to read the call to worship responsively by reading the indented part. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow. To take each moment and live, each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. And for those of you who would be so kind to read with me the morning prayer, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I've asked Serge to read the first passage because it reminds us that warfare and the horrors of war have been long with us. This passage has been taken from a battle that took place 3,000 years ago. Reading from the first book of Samuel, Serge, if you'd be so kind. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled before the Philistines, and many fell on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard on Saul, and the archers found him, and he was badly wounded by them. Then Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, so that these may not come and thrust me through and sport of me. But his armor-bearer was unwilling, for he was terrified. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor-bearer and all his men died together on the same day. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gabor. They cut off his head, stripped off his, stripped off his armor, and they put his armor in the temple of Astarte, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethel. I've also asked Serge to read the following. Just let me say, please bear with us as we go through this. This service is going to go back and forth and back and forth in the complexity of war. 
If you would please search. On October 19th, 2003, the Ohio based newspaper gave the Toledo Blade. The Toledo Blade launched a four day series of investigative reports exposing a string of atrocities by an elite volunteer, 45 man Tiger Force unit of the U.S. Army's 101st Airborne Division over the course of seven months in 1967. The Blade goes on to state that in 1971, the Army began a four and a half year investigation of the alleged torture of prisoners, rape of civilian women, the mutilation of bodies and killing civilians, among other acts. The articles further report that the Army's inquiry concluded that U.S. soldiers committed war crimes ranging from murder and assault to dereliction of duty. However, not one of the soldiers, even of those still on active duty at the time of the investigation, was ever court-martialed in connection with the heinous crimes. That song by the animals was one of the most popular songs in Vietnam and amongst Vietnam vets. Um, I've asked Andrea, Andrea to read the following from, um, from the Mahabharata. It's a reading from Paul Robinson. Andrea, if you'd be so kind. The Indian Hindu epic, the Mahabharata, offers the first written discussions of a, quote, just war, end quote, the Dharma Yuda, or righteous war. In it, one of the five ruling brothers, Pandavas, asks if the suffering caused by war can ever be justified. A long discussion then ensues between the siblings, establishing criteria like proportionality, Chariots cannot attack cavalry, only other chariots, no attacking people in distress, just means, no poisoned or barbed arrows, just cause, no attacking out of rage, and fair treatment of captives and the wounded. The war in the Mahabharata is preceded by context that develops the just cause for the war including last-minute efforts to reconcile differences to avoid war. Our um, responsive reading today is really, really, in many ways, the essence of what it's all about. If you'd be kind enough to read in the green. Spirit of life, whom we have called by many names, and in thanksgiving and anguish, Bless the poets and those who mourn. Send peace for the soldiers who did not make the wars, but whose lives were consumed by them. Let strong trees grow above graves, far from home. Breathe through the arms of their branches. <clears throat> the earth will swallow your tears while the dead sing, no more, never again, Remember me. For the wounded ones and those who receive them back, let there be someone ready when the memories come, when the scars pull and the buried metal moves, and forgiveness of those of us who were not there for our ignorance. And in us, Veterans in a forest of a thousand fallen, fallen promises. Let new leaves of protest grow on our stumps. Give us courage to answer the cry of humanity's pain. And with our bare hands out of full hearts, with all our intelligence, let us create the peace. And then I've asked Andrea to read from the prophet Micah. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. 
For out of Zion shall go forth instruction. But they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. As uh, we begin this morning's share, <clears throat> Let me begin with a couple of caveats, if I can. <clears throat> First of all, I find myself getting a bit emotional, uh, which I didn't expect. And um, I'm going to ask you to be extraordinarily patient with me today, because this is not going to be going in a strict, very Unitarian way, A, B, C, D, very, very this. It's going to be here and there and here and there and very multi-layered. So I'm asking for your patience today is I'm trying to do something different than the way I usually do it. You know, um, when you say the following, it's kind of freaky. I've lived longer than three quarters of a century. Now think about it, it's kind of freaky when you think about it. And what happens is when you've lived more than three quarters of a century, you see things that you'd never, ever, ever understand till you get this age. For many of you, you you probably remember like I did that very, very famous movie, Good Morning Vietnam! I'm going to deny me, deny me, deny me! We're going to, yes. Remember Robin Williams screaming Good Morning Vietnam and all the satire of how awful it was. And for those of us of a certain age, war meant Vietnam. And you know, you and I, if you were my age, didn't get, just simply didn't get why World War II veterans didn't understand what we seemed to think was so clear. Vietnam War veterans who liberated genocide camps and Holocaust camps, World War II veterans who liberated Japanese horror camps, they were trying to say something, but we didn't get it. We knew everything. What was that song? I'm so much older than I'm younger than that today. We thought we knew everything. We saw Vietnam and, and just it simply did not make sense to any of us. It was very clear. War was very, very bad. And look at all the bad things. We saw many of us things as black and white. And um, war was bad. And what classic examples, My Lai Massacre, does anybody even remember it? We, we define war as, for instance, like the My Lai Massacre. The My Lai Massacre took place on 16 March 1968, when First Lieutenant William Calley and a platoon went into a village and murdered between three and 500 people who were unarmed. The army finally guessed there may have been six or seven Viet Cong who were unarmed, but everybody else was unarmed civilians. They were all dead. So shocking was this, the army tried to cover it up. And when it was finally uncovered by accident and a leak a year later, you know what happened. And this became, for many people, the defining moment of war, war is all about. And I remember being so self-righteous, knowing it all, war is obviously bad, and everybody who fights war and all that stuff. Until, you know, sometimes somebody will say something and it's so profound, it knocks you off your feet. And I remember reading an article, I was in Brookline, reading an article and it said, why do you take out your anger on returning soldiers who are 19 and 20 who have been shell-shocked Simple people, high school graduate. Did you see any, any, many college graduates drafted back then? Did you see many of the senator's sons drafted? Oh, no, you saw 18 and 19 year olds. One of my good friends in high school, Arfine, Arfine Alley, was one of the first ones to introduce me to the black community at Atlantic City High School. Two months after we graduated, was drafted into Vietnam and died two months after that. Take a look, this article said, at who was drafted. 18, 19, 20-year-olds who didn't know anything about it. They just went because this was their country. They thought that's what they were supposed to do. 
You give them basic training and drop them in jungles in a foreign country they know nothing about. They're being shot at, being bombed by their own bombers by mistake. They come back and then a bunch of self-righteous people are screaming at them, not the people who are making the decisions as if it was all their fault. It's all very complex. It's not simple. So your minister here gets up to the United Parish in Brookline and asks in a sermon, are we yelling at the wrong people? Yelling at 19 and 20 year olds who have post-traumatic stress syndrome, who are shocked, shell shocked, a lot of them wounded in more ways, not just physically, but mentally. Are we, are we, are we, are we yelling at the wrong people? And half the congregation walked out. They said, how dare you defend them? And I said, if you're so Christian, shouldn't be compassionate and ask, what is the context of the people fighting? Who is fighting? Is it your kids or is it 18 and 19 year olds from middle America, high school, dropouts, high school? Who's really doing the fighting? Remember at seminary, I was asked, Kenneth, if four Ds, this is, you got to defer it if you were in seminary, if four Ds were required to go into uh, into service, would you go or would you protest? I said, I'd go. Most of you don't know this. I had an appointment to the U.S. Air Force Academy. And I turned it down. And the reason I turned it down is because I didn't want to fly. I was no good. I knew it was no good at it. And I said, there is somebody who is going to want to fly who deserves that, not me. And in fact, one of our members, I don't know if you knew this, is a retired two-star major general who saw service in Korea. The Korean in World War II did not get Vietnam. We did not, we thought we knew everything. And yet we look at this, and then we see that article that Serge read, there were more atrocities than we realized. Something happens in war. And one of the guys who was interviewed, who is it, me Lai, said, if you do, if you don't do what the commanding officer says, you're going to get shot. He said, yes, it's okay after it's all over. And everybody's screaming at you, why didn't you do this? He said, well, what happens is you're going to get shot. It's going to be said the enemy shot you and nobody's going to stand up for the fact he tried to say, no, this is wrong and got shot. By the way, you also need to know at me lie. There were five or six people that did, in fact, shield innocence. There were a couple of uh, corpsmen, uh, a medic from um, from one of the helicopters that finally landed and a few others. Who really understands Vietnam? People died. We say we have 2,500 missing in action. The latest count is there are about 2 million missing in action in Vietnam. Now, all these years later, do you know what happened in 2022? We had, are you ready for this? A 138 billion trade with Vietnam. 138 billion dollars trading import and export with Vietnam. Yeah, we had all those hundreds of thousands of soldiers in Vietnam, a lot of deaths everywhere. And who suffers the most? Civilians. Do we ever hold up in all this discussion about war collateral damage? Don't you love that phrase? That has to be one of the most obscene phrases ever invented. Collateral damage. Collateral damage. The people who accidentally, wrong place, wrong time, get in the way. Oops, we just napalmed a village of innocent people. Gee, sorry about that. You know, mistakes happen. Or we just bombed our own people. Oops, sorry about that too. Innocent civilians. So we thought we knew everything about all there was to do. We thought with me lie, that was unique. And I think one of the biggest things that offended many of us during the Vietnam War era is we just assumed that somehow our soldiers were better than everybody else. And in fact, guess what? Probably 95% were. That's the thing we tend to forget. Atrocities are always committed by the few. And oftentimes, because the atrocities are so awful, we tend to forget all the rest of the people involved. What do you say? 
to a 20 year old who grew up on a farm, who's now 2000 miles away, now maybe in Afghanistan. Have you ever looked at the geography of Afghanistan? Take a look at the, uh, the, the geography of Afghanistan, for instance, and you take a look at this and you say, what, how? And you're there and people don't want you there. And it's very, very difficult when you're fighting in another country. You don't know the people. They don't know you. You don't know the customs. You, they don't know your language. You don't know theirs. It is incredibly complex and terrorizing for everybody. And in every war ever fought, you look at the civilian numbers of deaths and it will shock you. I was reading in World War II, they estimate the number of civilians who died in World War II is over 100 million. 100 million over that. By the way, speaking of, um, of um, war, I remember when I was in Brookline, and I went to visit the local um, Veterans Administration, and they were having a thing for people who were chaplains and ministers to meet. And there I was in with a room of 40, 20 to 25-year-olds, all of whom had been physically wounded, missing an arm, missing a leg, grievous injuries. And rather than listening to the political protesters or the congressman or somebody blabbing, I actually listened to them. And I cried. I just cried. I didn't know what to do. I felt totally overwhelmed by this thing called war. Now, lest it appear that we 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 are somehow unique this vietnam thing was unique let me point out two things that you may not you may have forgotten does anybody remember the genocide in rwanda a million people died in 4 months and president clinton said we didn't want to get involved 4 months and a million people were slaughtered does anybody know what the longest war is going on right now on the planet? Estimated million dead, 5 million civilians. It is a country, the 11th, the 11th largest landmass on the planet. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? The Congo. The Congo is still involved with civil wars from Angola, Uganda, still involved with stuff from South Africa, what used to be Rhodesia, and from Rwanda. Five million civilians are dead, and the war is not over yet from, from all the fighting that is going on. If you go and read about the Democratic Republic of the Congo right now, you will cry, it is destroyed. One of the richest planets on the earth, and it is destroyed. Civilians. And then just when I thought I had it all, you know, well, war is, you know, war is bad. What happens? Ukraine comes along. Ukraine. Now, how do you begin to talk about that to people like me who think we know everything? Here you have a country that's minding its own business. And here we go, another player. Russia comes along and decides, oh, I want your land. I'm going to take it because I can. Now, that upsets the apple cart because just when you think you know everything that war is bad. You're not going to fight war. There ain't going to be any war anymore. What are you going to do with Ukraine? What are you going to do with Ukraine? A country that's minding its own business and gets attacked. Wow. And then we do we see atrocities all over again? Have you been reading? Have you been reading about the murder rooms they found? in liberated areas, the execution rooms they found, is something out of World War II, it's unbelievable. So you go to question. Do you just say to Ukraine, I'm sorry, peace at all costs, or you defend what you have? Um, I don't like war. I don't like innocents being killed. I don't like what war does to combatants and everybody else. 
It is a gross, gross thing. But then I'm stuck. What do you do? What do you do when there are times when you've got bleak choices? What do you do in World War II? When you've got one country exterminating, exterminating not only five to six million Jews, they wiped out 900 ministers of the Protestant church in Germany, it's cream of its crop. They wiped out Roma, mentally ill, homosexuals, LBGTQ, three million Poles were wiped out in the extermination camps. That's a figure nobody's aware of. What do you do when you see that? Do you sit back and say, we don't want to get involved? What do you do when the Japanese attack Nanking and kill 3,300,000 people in a couple of days? Do you sit back and say, well, it's not our thing? What do you do? What do you do? There's that very famous thing. Do you ever heard of Martin Niemöller? Oh, you would have loved Martin. I am sorry about that. The Xfinity guy just came and started working on my... Um, my uh outside he's at this started working on my thing and then i said could you at least have let me know you were coming to do that and he got mad at me so i apologize for that he said if you don't like it i'm working on it go report me so i apologize for that i had no idea they were coming today i think he forgot it was sunday all right getting back to where i was you have ukraine come along and then i talked about congo Congo has been in a 10 to 15 year war. It's not ending. Five million civilians. What do you do? And I thought it was interesting that for those of us who question, what are you going to do if somebody attacks you? What if we are right here, a country, right here, you and I, a country, and we're minding our own business and we get attacked? Now, I understand, let me make this very clear. I understand passivism. But the problem with passivism is, what do you do if it's selective? And that's where it becomes a problem. You say, well, I'm not going to fight this war, but I'm going to fight that war. And this is why I think that, um, this is why I think that uh, it's interesting. And I don't know why this, why this happens, but Hindus never in our society get the credit they're due for. The very, very first group to talk about just war were the Hindus in their very, very famous Mahabharata, especially in the Bhagavad Gita. And Andrea read from that. And you'll notice how common sense it was. It was trying to deal with things as they are realistically. And this, by the way, was written probably about 2,500 to 3,000 years ago. And it was interesting. A long discussion then ensues between siblings, establishing criteria like proportionality. Chariots cannot attack cavalry. No attacking people in distress. Just means. No poisoned or barbed arrows. Just cause. No attacking out of rage. Fair treatment of captives and wounded. Now, this was written 2,500 to 3,000 years ago. There has to be and a response if you are attacked. Now, we can either say we're going to give up and we're not going to have a response, or we're going to fight back, but if you're going to fight back, there has to be rules. Now, on top of all of this, all of this comes a really disturbing thought. And this really throws a wrench into it all. You and I can talk about war, just war, the horrors of war, but underlying this comes something that nobody ever, ever likes to talk about. I think you've all heard of um, Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall spent a lifetime discovering chimpanzees. And she wrote a book through a window my 30 years with the chimpanzees of Gombe. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, G-O-M-B-E. There was a chapter in this, this ma massive, famous book called The Gombe Chimpanzee War. A group of chimps separated from the larger groups of chimps. The war lasted four years, and at the end of the war, the group that separated had all been slaughtered. 
slaughter. The chimpanzees had major chimpanzee war had major implications for both good all personally and their academic community. Many of the chimps that lost their lives during the conflict were chimps that Goodall had known closely. Each had a name, a face, and a personality. This is the first time that war marked the first instance that primatologists observed chimps engaging in calculated, cold-blooded murder, a behavior that had previously been considered exclusively ours. In short, if you want to know where our, our thing for war comes from, it comes from our DNA. What nobody seems to like to deal with the fact, you and I are 98.9% .9 chimpanzee. That is a lot of DNA, folks. That is who and what we are. You women see this stuff all the time. You wonder why this happens. Did you ever see guys on the soccer team or football team and they slap each other in the butt? And women wonder, why are they doing that? That's what male chimps do in a, in a, in a troop as, as, as acknowledgement. Did you ever see when the president is giving the State of the Union address, as he walks down the aisle, people have to touch him. They touch him. When the head of the troop walks by, people have to touch him. Group Troops of chimps have been observed now that we know what we're looking for. When a large troop decides it wants more land, it's going to gather its males together and attack Andrea and Mary Grimmy and Chet, and they're going to slaughter the babies. They're going to they're going to force the women into sex and kill the males and take over the land. We've observed that now. It is within our DNA to go to war to grab what we want. Putin is a classic example of a troop run by a bully that's grabbing other land. It is classic primatology 101. If you want to see something scary, take a full-grown chimp and have that chimp stand next to a homo sapien full-grown. The book says, run. Run, if you can. We are 98.9% .9 chimp, and it is within our DNA to grab, to war, to hurt, to maim. It's absolutely essential. There we have communities like this to remind ourselves really where we come from and what we have to do to ourselves and others from raw instinct. I don't joke about this, but I do. Imagine you and I are in a classroom. There is a door right where Nick and his friend are sitting. Right in the back there, there's a door. A bunch of zombies come in. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Are my students, all college students with good smarts, are they going to say, let's collectively use our smarts, put desks together, build a wall, get the people who have trouble and have, have, um, are neurodivergent out? Or is it going to be every person for themselves? It's going to be every person for themselves. Those who get trampled will be blamed later on because they didn't have the stuff to get out. They'll be blamed, though you trampled them. And I said to my students, hello, I would be left there, old me, ancient of days himself, and somebody would finally say, half hour later, what happened to the professor? The only people who would stay with me if that happened would be my two dachshunds. That's an interesting commentary on humanity. A whole class of college-educated students would flee, but my two dachshunds would stay with me to the bitter end. That's a damning thing if you think about it. So when we think about war, we can think of it intellectually, but we've also got to realize that it is built heavily within our DNA. When you start, I keep on telling my students, we need to read Primatology 101 before you even touch Psychology 101. Because there's a lot of stuff within us that is innate, and it's scary. And it becomes absolutely essential that communities like this exist everywhere to remind us of our better selves. To remind us there are those we have to look after. Whether you like war or not, there are innocent people that get drafted to fight wars and what happens to them when they come back broken and hurt. Now, I don't like Vietnam. I thought it was telling, by the way, a classic example of Vietnam. You've heard of the tunnels, the famous Vietnamese tunnels. Do you know who's the very first group to warn us about those? And we paid no attention to them till they blew up for us? 
The Australians, it's documented. The Australians said they're building tunnels under here and we paid no attention. What do the Australians know? War is a mess. The civilians get slaughtered, irres irresponsive of which side they're on. And people come back broken and maimed for life. You and I have a responsibility to have compassion, understanding, and caring. And so at this Memorial Day, I lift up all of those, all of those whom we know who have, who have been part of all of this. I, 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 I remind us that, you know, I'm no senator's son. Who gets drafted? Who goes to war? The senator's son? I seem to recall certain presidents didn't get to war either. They got, ex they got um, yes, deferments. Now, if somebody I mentioned before, if I was asked if I had to go uh, with a 3, 4D, would I go? Yes. I told you I gave up my, my appointment to the Air Force Academy for somebody who would fly. As I said, we have a two-star major general here who was in the Air Force, and he would agree with that. You don't put somebody like me in an Air Force Academy if they're not going to fly and make it as a career. But I'll tell you one thing, I probably wouldn't have come back. But if I had to go as a 4D after seminary, they said, you will go to, to Vietnam, I would have gone. But it wouldn't have been any desk job. I would have gone in the infantry. Why? Because that's where people get hurt. That's where things happen. So my, my love, my heart, my care goes out to Alphine, who died four months after graduating from high school. To months out, he's drafted. Two months later, he's dead in Vietnam. For all the people came back broken. To those boys, boys, young boys, 20 to 25, who I sat with in Brookline. And I also pray for the congregation that walked out saying, you don't get it. They fought. And I'm saying, you didn't get it. You didn't fight. They did. So for all the complexity, for all the confusion, for all the fog, for all the hurt, I ask your compassion, your care, your prayers, your attempted understanding, and to hold all of those who've died close to us this Memorial Day. And if you can do that with me, if you can walk with me, I'm grateful. Grateful indeed. Amen. Students know nothing about Vietnam. They know the name, but that's it. Those of us who remember Vietnam really didn't understand World War II. It is a strange, strange, mixed up world. Yes, Maureen, really. This cup and this bread transcend it all. It is an offering of simple bread to welcome everyone here. Life is incredibly complex, completely layered. There has to be a place where all are held close and loved. Bread and a simple cup have been symbolic for millennia of welcome to all. May it be so here as well. And following some words we say, would you say after me, please? Promise me you'll remember. You are braver than you believe. Stronger than you seem. Smarter than you think. God didn't promise. Days without pain. Laughter without sorrows. Sun without rain. But the divine did promise. Strength for the day. Comfort for the tears. And light for the way. Andrea, if you would. Andrea, you have to unmute. You have to unmute. There we go. Hmm. Thought I did that, sorry. 
you to join me in the spirit of prayer or meditation as you are moved, able, and or willing. Most holy God, that divine source known by so many names and none at all, hear us, we pray. Bless our honored dead this day. We remember our ancestors, all of the ones who fought for freedom through the ages, for peace, for justice, all of our ancestors who held the conflicted nature of violence and pacifism. We hold them, we hold them in our hearts with the same tension that they did in their own time. Bless our honored ancestors, the ones who gave their all, however that may be, just so that we may be as we are and continue to be in the here and the now. Most holy God, remember those today who are overcome with the turmoil of this day. Help us to remember the human cost of lasting peace and freedom. Help us to remember to be the kindness we want to see in the world. Help us to remember the sick, the ill, the struggling of body, mind, and soul under the weight of modern society. Help us be a blessing to them and to ourselves. Help us to remember the incarcerated and the unhoused, the migrant and the refugee, all of our invisible and visible siblings and cousins caught in the webs of oppression. As we remember them, O oh God, we pray for liberation as we work for justice and we ask for blessings upon this work. Let us be your hands in the word, in the world, as we are agents for the spirit of life and agents for peace in a world focused on war. We ask and we pray. Selah and amen. After our <clears throat> final words, <clears throat> please stay for a moment so we can greet everybody and um, say hello to Andrea, if you would. <clears throat> and now may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall softly upon your fields. And when we meet again, may the divine in me greet and embrace the divine in you. Amen. Let's go around and say hello to everybody for a minute before you go. I want you to say hello to Andrea. Have a chance to say hello to Andrea back. We got Nick and his guests with us this morning. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> Andrea is here. Mary Grimmy from Tampa. Chet, my classmate. Pam is from, um, Pam is from, where'd you go? Pam is from um, uh, Forest Hills. We got Christine and John. Felix is here. Bobby Vance is here. Pat Sullivan, Cecilia, Amelia, Maureen, Dennis, Alan and Eddie. There's Pam. Carol is here too. Greg, Russell, the, the Feenies. Carol and Larry Deach, Pat Can Care, Serge and Christopher Diaz. Yes. Thank you all for being so patient when my Xfinity guy arrived and started to dismantling everything, and I lost my voice. Um, Andre is a friend of um, of uh, Michelle's, and um, Andre, would you like to say hello to everybody for a moment? Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, <laughs> no, hello. that's not going to work. <laughs> I put her Hi, on the spot Henry. too. So, so. Ken kind of undersells my relationship with Mich Michelle slightly. Michelle was responsible for me going to seminary. 
So she's a little more than a friend and a whole lot of a, there's a word, I can't think of it right now, I haven't enough coffee, but I met Michelle at my first home congregation where she was the intern and we hit it off like two thieves planning a heist. And when I actually started at Meadville, she introduced me to some folks that were instrumental in really forming a really solid peer group for me getting through seminary. Uh, she opened up her place while I was doing my CPE rotation in Chicago. So I had a place to stay during that summer and Chicago is, or Michelle is probably okay. one of the best people I know. So Michelle is a little more than just a friend. But, you know, other than that, there's a bunch, you know, I'm an army vet. My spouse, my wife is an army vet. Uh, mm -hmm. We both come from the, we both come from family lines of military vets, uh, mostly army and Navy. I mean, ask what you want. I'll either answer it or I won't. <laughs> to, to you, you Andrea. Where did you serve, Andrea? Uh, I served, uh, when I was in the Army, I served at Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, up on the West Coast, uh, 95 to 97, uh, part of President Clinton's drawdown of the, the service numbers. So I got out a little early. Where are you living now? Quad Cities. Um, uh, Devonport, Iowa area. Yes, Rock I know. Island, Bettendorf, wherever all the other town is. <clears throat> Why did they call it Quad City? Are there four cities that converge? Actually, there's seven. Um, <laughs> it started as three. It started as Fort Devonport, Island. Rock Island, and... Moline. All the way over there. And mm -hmm. then there you are, all the way kind there. of sprung up and it became the Quad Cities. And then as you know, a couple of the others the other towns sprung up, they wanted to be included, but the the name Quad Cities had kind of <laughs> stuck regionally. And they couldn't really come up with a way to make, you know, Quint Cities or Sep Cities work colloquial or colloquially and Quad Cities was it. Um, we are um, <clears throat> I'm trying to work with uh, Andy to see if she would like to come back and share one Sunday. Um, as I said, she's been to college. I lost my voice this morning. <clears throat> <clears throat> I think that shows what happens when you get caught off guard, like when the, suddenly your screen goes, <laughs> goes off. <laughs> You're like, whoa, what happened? All right, um, she, uh, again, uh-oh, Comcast strikes again. <laughs> Comcast strikes again, <laughs> yep, he's finished, frozen. Uh, college and seminary three years. I was wondering if Andy would might want to come back and share sometime, and, um, uh, am I... Can you, am I, can you hear me? Am I out? Am I out? You're back. Uh, you're, you're back. Okay. Okay. It says my thing is, is unstable. Okay. Um, what I'm trying to do is ask if Adria might be interested in coming back to share Sunday, which means that she's stuck with me, um, uh, assisting her, anybody else who wants to read. Michelle did warn me. She said, you know, after Adria met with you, she's still recovering. So I have to watch out. <laughs> it is to work with me. Um, <clears throat> Um, this is an example of what we do, Andrea, on, on Sundays. Uh, Danny Sorkin, who was here a moment ago, uh, run, uh, is, is a marvelous uh, uh, coordinator of a, a, book, a book study group we have on Saturday mornings. And uh, you've got to meet Danny and, and some of this group here is on Saturday morning as well. And then um, <clears throat> again, for um, the rest of you, please do think about the thing about climate change. I'll be sending something about that out in the email this week. Andrew, do you have any questions before we, before we, uh, any things you want to ask us or anything before we? Uh... Yeah, 
Yes. Go ahead. So while I so while I would love to come back and share. I mean, there's there's a number of topics that I could come back and share, share on. Is there anything in, and this is a dangerous, but oh. this is dangerous, but knowing that I reserve the ultimate right to say no, is there anything in particular that perhaps I should bring back as a topic? Anybody have anything that they're, they're particularly interested in that uh, they would like to throw out to Andrea to see if she'd be interested in kicking around? I think, Andrea, if you become better known to us, you're going to find this is not a shy group. <laughs> they will share all kinds of things with you regularly, which I think is a blessing, personally, but I'm just... Join our book club, Andrea. I will do what I can. Well, okay then, everybody. Let's go one more time, Andrea. If you if you can uh, stay on after everybody goes for a minute, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay, Nick and your friend. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Mary Grimmy, Chet, Pam, Cecilia, Bobby. Our best to your better half, Pat, Felix, Jose, Alan, and Eddie, Maureen, Amelia, Greg, Grisel, Serge, and Christopher. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye.